everybody for joining us today. It looks like we have close to 400 people here. And so thanks for joining us. And the purpose of today's session is to give you a chance to ask questions, to provide feedback and to share ideas that you have. Um, I'm President Andy Armacost and I'm here today with many of our senior administrators uh, to address all of your questions and to give you um, good answers. And uh, for those items that we can't answer today, we'll certainly post them on our Frequently Asked Questions page on, on the blog. But let me begin by taking just a quick moment to express my gratitude for all of your hard work. Faculty and staff members, you've really kept our mission moving forward here on campus. And so again, let me offer my thanks. And I know it's how tough it's been with all the precautions we've had to take to minimize the risk to you while we operate on campus. But as we continue to deliver the best possible education to our students, we are undoubtedly impacted by these restrictions, but my hat's off to you for making such great things happen throughout this fall semester. And let me just remind you that it's important for us to take these same precautions in our personal lives too. You've seen the spread of COVID throughout our communities and across the state and uh, the rates of infection at our testing events um, have, uh, have been significant. And so uh, we just encourage you to take those precautions. And as you get ready to travel uh, or to consider getting together with family members over the Thanksgiving uh, weekend, um, uh, let me uh, adopt a phrase that I heard today, lay low before you go. In other words, protect yourself. Make sure that if you do take the steps of traveling, um, then make sure that you minimize the risk to yourselves and others so that you don't spread uh, the virus as you're traveling to visit with family members. So lay low before you go and make sure you test before you do. All right, other areas of interest that in addition to COVID, which has been front and center on all of our minds is uh, just a few points. Uh, our task force for diversity, equity and inclusion will begin sharing their findings with me and the executive council during the month of November. And we'll have opportunity to share their great work more broadly with the campus uh, throughout the month of, of November and into December. I'm certainly eager to hear all of their ideas and to explore how we're going to put uh, those great ideas into practice. In addition, we have a task force on the future of education at UND and it's just now started its work and we're eager to, to see who volunteers and, and, and what that composition is of that particular committee. In addition, we have two important hires going on, of course, the hiring of our new provost and vice president for academic affairs, as well as our uh, Odegaard School of Aerospace Sciences, the dean uh, for the Odegaard School, those are well underway. And uh, finally, I know there's been a lot uh, of attention paid to what happened yesterday and what's continuing to happen, um, but the results of the elect election are still unknown. And the result, of course, um, which we don't know what it's gonna be, certainly has the chance to divide us as, as a nation. Um, but let me encourage each of us to take the chance to come together during this time. In our daily lives, uh, we do something so important. We help our students, transition from one stage in their lives to the next, to develop their ability to think critically and to reason and to give them the foundation for their future success. And let's make sure that higher purpose um, keeps us together uh, to keep our conversations about goings on in the community respectful and appreciative of the, of the different opinions and perspectives we have on our campus. And so let, let's have that sense of togetherness dominate our words, our actions and our habits. So um, that's a challenge for all of us uh, that uh, living in a civilized democracy, um, we need to, to make sure the lines of communication are open with those who agree with us and those who disagree with us. Um, so um, keep that in mind, please. And now let me turn it over to Jed Shivers, our Vice President for Finance and Operations, who has dutifully served as our COVID lead uh, over the summer and into this fall. And he's also been an outstanding moderator for these Zoom sessions and these town halls. So Jed, over to you. Thanks, President Armacost. So I'm Jed Shivers. I'm the Vice President for Finance and Operations and the COVID lead person uh, for the campus, working with a really marvelous multidisciplinary team of anywhere between 25 and 45 people. We meet Monday through Friday. So uh, if you recall, as we've done these uh, meetings before, we have uh, asked people to provide us with some questions. And I'm happy to say we've even gotten a couple of questions already. I really urge you to use the Q&A function in the Zoom and submit questions. So I'm gonna go through a few of the questions that we've already gotten, assign, you know, ask people to answer those. And sometimes I might answer them myself. And then we really wanna get into the questions that you are all are uh, asking of us 
in as close to real time as we can. And of course, as Andy mentioned, uh, if we can't get to a specific question during this time, we'll be sure to um, you know, answer it in the Q&A afterwards. So never fear, we'll uh, make an effort to answer every question one way or another. And I just wanna check, I think probably just for housekeeping, a few minutes before the end of the hour, probably gonna turn it back to President Armacost. Does that sound like a reasonable plan? Yep, that's the nod. Okay, so uh, with that, let's let's get on to some some of the questions that people have asked, and please do send in those questions to the Q and A. Now, um, I think for this question, I'm going to turn to uh, Rosie Dube, uh, and uh, this is something that I've also been involved with, also. Uh, but I think it's clear that vaccines are coming. The timing is somewhat uncertain probably fair to say that the initial set of vaccine that the states get, the state gets will be probably given to the most vulnerable population of the state. So you can imagine it going out into people in nursing homes and into, uh, into um, you know, for healthcare providers, et cetera. But the question here is what will UND's role, and I think Josh Wynn ought to be able to, Dr. Josh Wynn ought to be able to comment on this too. What will UND's role be in the state's distribution of a COVID-19 vaccine? Where would UND faculty, staff, and students fall in the priority queue for vaccinations? And uh, will UND require vaccinations for future semester enrollment? So uh, maybe, um, Dr. Wynn, if you wouldn't mind just thinking through the question of where do you see, what do you think the timing is for these vaccines? What's your best guess on how ubiquitous or when they'll become, you know, fairly widespread? Uh, thanks very much, Jed. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Good. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, so there, there's been an interesting back and forth between the federal government and the vaccine manufacturers, as you may be aware, as to when they'll be available and approved. And if anything, there was an interesting thing where the emphasis from the pharmaceutical industry is we want to make sure that the vaccines are safe and effective. And the, at least one prominent spokesman for the federal government was we got to get it out there tomorrow. So it was almost like uh, there was a flipping of positions. As a matter of fact, there was an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine taught, and the title of the article was something like up is down. Uh, but given that, I think the realistic expectation is that around the first of the year, it's likely or possible that vaccines will be available. The state of North Dakota is working on the distribution plan almost literally as we speak. The uh, highest priority is going to be for healthcare providers, likely followed by long term care. So students, faculty, and staff at UND will be somewhat down the distribution list. And I think realistically, we're talking probably about second quarter to third quarter of next year. But this is largely going to be controlled through, uh, through the state government, since that's the way the distribution is coming from the federal government, even though manufactured by private industry. So that, that would be my time frame based on currently available information. Thank you very much, Dr. Wynn. And uh, Rosie, if you would just comment quickly, where do you see the role of the student health service paying, playing here? So for example, I know in flu shots, it's the student health service that's a primary provider of flu shots. And I should note that we did buy a nice uh, minus 80 degree freezer to store these vaccines should they become available to us. Student health will be active in administering the vaccination once it's available. We currently are meeting with our community partners about the prioritization lists and the state plan that was submitted for vaccination. So yes, when we're able to vaccinate, we will be out there to vaccinate. We also will be potentially assisting um, the community in their efforts as well. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think uh, one of the things about this, people talk all the time about COVID fatigue and uh, but there's no question that this extraordinary situation that we all find them ourselves in takes its toll. So I think uh, one question, which I do think is important to address, and I'm gonna ask uh, Peggy Varberg, our AVP for Human Resources, to talk about this briefly. 
is uh, faculty and staff are at real risk of burning out after a long summer and fall. What kind of mental health resources are available for faculty and staff? So we know that our uh, employee assistance program is always available and there's contact information that's on our website about that. Um, we also have a multidisciplinary group working on um, this particular topic to uh, maybe offer some webinars or um, some roundtable discussions and so forth, uh, hopefully occurring uh, one this month and one uh, the beginning of next month and then more after the first of the year to help us all talk about how we're feeling and um, the different issues that we're facing uh, COVID related with stress, with working remotely. Um, additionally, with uh, the elections and the outcome there, that's you know caused a lot of stress as well. Um, so we do have uh, those things uh, at work right now. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, next question I'd like to address is for uh, Provost Stores. And this question is, uh, and this really, we're getting into the admissions issues for the following uh, semester. Uh, what changes, if any, might we see in admission requirements for incoming freshmen as a result of the pandemic? Should we plan for those changes to be long-term changes? And uh, I think we've actually been asked about uh, similar questions related to the graduate schools as well. Thanks, Jed. Hi, everyone. Debbie Storrs, Interim Provost. Hope everyone's doing well. Thank you again for your work, working with and supporting our students. Um, our admissions process has changed slightly because of COVID, and we are working in coordination with the NDUS system office. And what has changed is rather than rely on a combination of ACT or test scores, standardized test scores, and high school GPA, we are admitting based on GPA alone. And this is a result of the difficulty students are get, having in high school of accessing ACT tests. Uh, so we've been allowed to do that uh, through summer of 2022. And we are in discussions now about whether that should continue post summer 2022, uh, in part because we know high school GPA is a better predictor of student academic success than standardized test scores. Um, and in terms of the graduate admissions, those are program specific and some programs, some graduate programs have elected to forego GRE or other graduate uh, standardized tests, uh, but that's really up to the program faculty to make those decisions. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, I'm going to combine the, I'm uh, pretty much actually at the end of our uh, of our questions that have been pre-submitted. So I'm going to combine these last two and then we're going to move right into the questions that you're currently submitting online. Uh, the first question uh, I'm going to answer, the second question I'm going to ask Debbie Storrs to answer, but they're all, they're thematically similar in that they both relate to uh, what's the long-term plan? What, how much of this that's taking place now during the pandemic will we continue to see afterwards? So the question for me is, uh, what's the long-term plan for students at UND regarding their campus experience, including housing, both residence halls and apartments, one gets the impression that UND is moving towards creating University of Phoenix of the upper Midwest. What investment toward residence halls and apartments is the campus looking at as the future of UND? So I think that might've been a few questions. Uh, and I can answer that. Uh, I think, you know, UND is really committed to uh, the on-campus experience. Uh, one uh, piece of evidence of that is our strong desire to remain open during this pandemic as long as it's feasible and safe. Uh, another is when one looks around the campus, one sees the burgeoning uh, construction activity. In fact, just before this meeting, people were asking, is there a construction going on out there? Because they could hear it in the background. Yeah, <laughs> there is, there's quite a bit of it. You can look at the Memorial Union. Uh, you know, you can look at what's happening here on the quad. Uh, you can look at what's happening at Nistler College of Business, all of which relate to the on-campus experience. With regard to uh, student housing, uh, my colleague and I, Dr. Halgren, in conjunction with the rest of the Executive Council, have been working through a plan to try and develop uh, student housing. And uh, that includes perhaps some new construction and a fair amount of renovation. And uh, we are working through that right now with uh, partners that are in the private sector in a so-called P3 model. And we'll be continuing to work through that. So I'd say on that one, stay tuned. But the 
the effort to enhance the on-campus environment really never stops. And the university is quite committed to it. Uh, with regard to the next question, that's really, and I think these are so good because they're, it's like getting past the current time and looking into a forward direction. Um, in responding to COVID, UND has implemented a number of new initiatives and technologies with online, remote, and hybrid models, as well as we, how we communicate with students and faculty. Are there things that UND is doing in response to the pandemic that may continue in a non-pandemic environment? So I'm asking Debbie if you would be kind enough to answer. Absolutely. I, um, I think it's a really important question and one that we should be having conversations across departments, with department chairs and faculty, deans, etc. What lessons can we learn and glean from the pandemic that we might want to continue in the non-pandemic era, hopefully sooner than later when we get there. Uh, I will say that, you know, we have this task force that's co-led by John Shab and Jeff Van Loy, and that committee will be tackling with some of these questions. But certainly, I think all of us should be asking us ourselves, what, what do we want to continue to do? I will say, and Mata V. Marcinga is on, uh, available as well, you know, we've invested a lot of uh, technology in the classroom with CARES funding, which uh, we're grateful for. And we're, and we're actually going to enhance it even further to um, provide some flexibility for faculty. I think that opens up opportunities. And so um, I think it remains to be seen, but I would encourage all of us to be part of the discussion about what should continue, what is working, uh, what's more effective. And as, a, as an example, you know, I think, uh, the University Senate, we have great turnout via Zoom more so than in person. Is that something the Senate wants to continue? Some of the meetings that we have are really well attended. Maybe we want to continue these kinds of forums for better discussion and open dialogue. I'd be open to uh, all of us considering that. And then really quickly, uh, somebody else asked a question. And I just want to answer it in the context of this. Uh, the task force is uh, soliciting nominations, and this is the task force for the future of education. And I, I asked Jeff Van Loy and John Schab when they're going to uh, determine the membership. And the email I got back was at the latest by the end of November, and hopefully sooner than that, that it'll be announced. And I don't know, Mar uh, Madhavi, do you want to speak to any other pieces about um, how the technology might be enhanced and how it can encourage us to think differently moving forward post-pandemic? I certainly can. So uh, as everybody's aware, we did add the microphones, uh, uh, the cameras and the Wacom tablets uh, into every single one of our classrooms. So what we are doing right now is to uh, add ceiling mics to some of these uh, large classrooms because one of the complaints that we got was that the, when the, the students cannot hear, the online students cannot hear what's happening in the classroom, those discussions that are happening among students. So when we look at the improvements we are doing, I'm actually looking post COVID as well because there's a very good chance that we may not go back to how we did classrooms. There will be a student or two who may want to join the classroom uh, online. So, so every step that we are taking right now is looking at post COVID as well. Okay, and Peggy, did you wanna talk briefly about this with regards to staff, please? Yeah, if I can piggyback on that, you know, it's a great discussion to have with staff as well. Um, we've proven that this really works well in, in most areas. I mean, we have some positions obviously um, that, that can't function off campus, but we have many that can. And so um, this is a great opportunity for us to, you know, really review our staffing patterns and um, how we recruit positions and potentially offer more um, opportunity for folks to work remotely uh, from different states. Um, it's, it's a great recruiting perspective. And um, also it's just, it's a great balance. Uh, some employees really do well in this area. So um, I really encourage, you know, supervisors, managers, employees to have these discussions um, with, you know, going forward outside of, of the COVID um, environment. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Why don't we get on to the questions that people are uh, sending us on the fly here. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to run through as many of these as I can. Uh, and on this first question, I'm going to turn to myself <laughs> and I think Andy as well. 
Uh, and this is a question which we've answered in the past, but I think it's one that actually it's so important and understandable. It does deserve a repetition, which is, do you have a threshold of new cases per day in the Grand Forks area that will trigger a closure of campus? And I would say, uh, you know, they always say uh, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. So call me small minded. But one of the things that I think we've been quite consistent about is that uh, the number is not really the only factor that we look at. We're really looking at what's going on in our community. We're looking at our relative positivity rate compared to the community. We're looking at whether or not our contact tracers are able to continue to contact tracing because that's frankly a marker of whether or not we uh, have some control over what's going on in our immediate campus community. Uh, we're looking at what the status of the health system is. And I would say that we're getting to a point where, you know, we're starting to feel some of the stress here. There's just no two ways about it, no denying it. And I, and I, the only other thing I would add, and then I'm going to turn this uh, question to Andy, is I think it's something that we evaluate all the time and, uh, and, and really are trying to figure out, you know, when do we do this and uh, what do we gain by doing it, et cetera. So Andy, if, if you wouldn't mind also. Jed, that was a great answer. Um, and let me add that, um, or to reinforce what Jed said, that we're always thinking about this, um, all the different factors, the resources that exist to, to respond uh, to cases of the pandemic or to cases of infection, uh, the numbers. And there's further questions in the Q&A about um, if the positivity rate's 12%, why aren't we um, shutting down post Thanksgiving and, and so forth? And so we're always, as we said at the get-go, um, we're always evaluating this and we'll make what we think is the best decision for the campus um, that uh, takes account um, for the health and safety of our members, but also um, the, um, the desired uh, educational impact. And uh, as we speak with students, we know that uh, many of them, their, their strong preference is to remain kind of face-to-face -face as much as possible um, uh, to, to get that face-to-face -face experience. Um, so the evaluation is continuous. No, if you read the Grand Forks Herald last Friday, uh, there was a story about the inner workings of the, the decision. It wasn't really the inner workings, uh, but, um, but the discussions about how, uh, how we made decisions. And there was one point in August where the caseload was, was uh, meteoric and, um, and we were very close to making the call to go online at that point. And I'll be frank, uh, two, two weeks ago when the governor uh, indicated that uh, contact tracing uh, was gonna be shut down and they weren't gonna do contact tracing and we were seeing rates that were increasing, um, that got my attention as well. And we were on, on the verge of going online at that point until we got relief from the state to allow us to continue that important contact tracing. So we're monitoring all the factors that Jed is, is, is talking about. But, but again, principally, we're concerned uh, first and foremost for the health and safety of the members of the campus and that will, will drive our decisions. Thank you. <clears throat> a question for me, uh, and of course, you know, we're already into an anxious period and, and then the a really good question is, are we likely to experience budget cuts again in the 2021? It's a good question. Um, so obviously to a certain extent, uh, well, let me just, and I think it's the spring of 2021. So I'm thinking that we're talking about, uh, well, I'll take the question literally first. Uh, there's no plan to cut the budget uh, in the spring of 2021. If I would say that we uh, are forced to close uh, during that period and we get into issues of lost revenue as a result of the pandemic, then such things are possible. Uh, would they be budget cuts? You know, it depends on what's going on. We would really have to look and see what sort of federal avenues are available for relief before we made decisions like that. Uh, if you think through what happened in the fall, uh, lots of places cut their budgets very substantially going into the semester that we're in now because they had to throw all kinds of money at COVID preparedness. Uh, they had to, uh, you know, they were posting deficits on their operating side, even Harvard University went from a $300 million profit to a $10 million loss as reported in the New York Times. Um, so, you know, there were wild swings that were going on, forcing cuts. Uh, in our case, coming into the uh, FY21, uh, we did some uh, budget reduction as a function of lower, uh, projected lower enrollment and projected lower student credit hours. So, uh, you know, that would be the thing that would be a trigger for me. Going into the July, in other words, the following fiscal year, really the question is gonna be, 
what do our uh, what does our enrollment and credit hours look like, and what's the state's plan concerning the operating budget? Um, let me just get to my next question. Uh, this is one for Provost Storrs. When will the members of the Future of Academics Task Force be announced? Uh, I just answered that, Jed, uh, per Jeff Van Loy and John Schab, at the latest by the end of November and ideally um, by mid-November. Thank you, sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, here's a question for um, Rosie or Eric. Uh, who do we contact regarding COVID-related concerns? There seems to be no clear policy on positive cases within the university. It's an interesting question because uh, generally speaking, uh, when people are identified as positives, they're hooked into the contact tracer network who in turn contacts those individuals individually and then proceeds to contact the close contacts that they've had. Sorry, but that's really what it is. So, um, and I, I should point out, I, because my name is on the website, I get many, uh, queries as well, and we field them to various people around the university as appropriate. So uh, I'm hoping that there's not too much confusion about this, but if anybody here, and particularly Rosie and Eric, would like to elucidate further, that would be great. Um, this is Rosie, and I'm the Clinical Director of Response for COVID. I, I would like to make sure that people know about our COVID blog on our website. Um, there is a dashboard that is public facing for you to see our positivity rate, our, all, all that information is out there. Uh, if you haven't looked at that, please look at that. There's also, I think, a question coming up about Q&A, and that is also on the UND blog. If you scroll through the different areas of the blog, you'll find sections that um, have questions and answers that are relevant to our workplace and our presence on campus. Uh, if you have specific questions too, I'd encourage you to approach your supervisor um, I have contacted like my HR department for our department frequently on different things. Um, as Jed mentioned, emails come directly to him, they come to me. Uh, David Dawes receives them from UND Info. Uh, those are avenues that you can access also for your questions. And really, if you have a question about uh, if someone's positive or if you're positive and need assistance working through um, filling out the online reporting form. What does that mean for your office environment? Uh, who provides extra cleaning? You can always call the Office of Safety uh, and we will walk you through that process and line up the cleaning specifically for that area through facilities. Thank you. Um, so this is a question, it's an interesting question around uh, travel and I'm going to ask, I'm going to sort of direct this question probably to a combination of Josh Wynn and Debbie Stores and, and Andy Armacost. Question here is, uh, I think this is around Thanksgiving, which is why I, I mentioned it. With North Dakota positive test rates exceeding 12% since Halloween, why is it considered safe for people to travel home and then travel back to UND over holiday when they will only be back for a couple of weeks before they travel home again for the Christmas break. So probably the first question is, what's the policy concerning students, for example, uh, traveling? And then what's the policy about faculty and staff? So this is Debbie. I'll, I'll tackle a piece of this because I think there are multiple questions embedded in here. There are no restrictions on either staff or faculty or student or anybody's travel during the holiday for personal reasons. We certainly are encouraging students to test before they go home so that they are informed about their status, their health status. Um, and then similarly to, you know, to President Armacost's point, you know, um, to, to uh, be careful, to be cautious, and to take into consideration the, the situation across the state and beyond if you do choose to travel. Um, so, I mean, those are the pieces that I would be able to answer, but I think there are maybe some larger questions about, is it safe? I mean, I think we've all seen the numbers across the US and I'll let Dr. Wynn speak to that. 
And that's why we're continuing to uh, require the mask coverings, the distancing, the, the, the hand cleaning, the washing, et cetera, while people are on campus. But I'll turn it over to Dr. Wynn. And before Josh speaks, Debbie, let me just uh, uh, address the premise of the question. Is it safe to travel? And um, as we're monitoring uh, the percentage of positivities, we're seeing the positivity rates for our students actually started decreasing. Um, but then uh, beginning on Saturday, it, uh, it took a turn uh, to go the other direction. Um, and we're now analyzing all those positivity rates. So there's a lot of data out there about what, we, uh, what will guide our decisions about what's safest for the campus and what's safest for the members. But what we are seeing is that um, at least in the last uh, three sessions, our student positivity rates are actually lower than uh, others who are testing here. Um, so uh, we, just, uh, we have to monitor very carefully. Uh, Keep in mind, uh, decision making a first we give it to parents and students to make a best. So we have an experience giving. It's only change depending upon the conditions of the pandemic. And uh, you're right, um, there's not a rosy picture out there, as, as one um, person, one uh, commenter had said. Um, we have to be very careful with this. Josh, you want to comment briefly on uh, you know what what we what we think this question is about? Are you? There you yes, uh, I'm okay now. The space bar didn't work. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, uh, so I would say, notice that Jed emphasized the word briefly. I'll try to follow that part of the question. You're supposed to laugh at that. Um, the, um, we know that, especially in the Midwest, the, a lot of the uptick is related to small gatherings, not large gatherings. And based on that, I would say from a medical, not a UND standpoint, but a medical standpoint, that I am very concerned about Thanksgiving, not simply the travel, but the the congregation of families getting together. That is a recipe for further spread. So what my wife and I have decided on a personal level is much to our uh, disappointment, we're not gonna be having a Thanksgiving dinner with our extended families. We're just not doing it. And I think that's for all of us to determine, but the medical advice would be to be very careful about gatherings, particularly if one is not able to or one chooses not to do what Provost Stores suggested, which is to try to get tested right before it. Now, getting tested right before is no guarantee, but it does suggest in the short run that you might not be infectious. You still could have COVID and you may become infectious hours or days after that negative test, but that would be reassuring. Uh, but otherwise, I think each of us has to ask real questions about whether this is the Thanksgiving to travel and to get together with our families. Sad to say. Thanks, Josh. I hope that answered the question. As we noted, it was sort of a multi-part, multi-pronged question. And I really appreciate everyone participating and doing their best to answer. Uh, let's go back to our academic environment. Uh, this is a question for both, I think, Debbie Storrs and Madhavi. Uh, some students have had sporadic and sometimes frequent internet connection issues and are not receiving emails or aware that an assignment is due until it's too late. Is there any grace period of this if this happens so it doesn't hurt their grades? Sorry, I was muted. I can go first, all right. So if uh, the internet issues uh, are within the UND network, meaning if they're on campus or in the residential halls, do ask the students to uh, go ahead and uh, talk to the help desk. That way we can uh, see what's going on and uh, resolve it. Uh, if they're in, if they are quarantine or isolation in one of the UND uh, hotels, uh, UND designated hotels, they can speak to the front desk uh, at the hotel. If they are unable to do that, do ask them to drop a note to me or even uh, the help desk uh, because we contact the owners of the uh, hotels and work directly with them to make sure the network is uh, up to par so that they can actually get their work done. Uh, if they are in other places, home somewhere away from uh, 
uh, uh, service that we provide. Uh, if they continue to have any issues, uh, let's see what we can do so that they can get their work done. Thanks, Madhavi. The only thing, the only other thing I would say is to thank the faculty for their flexibility to the students when they're encountering such tech issues. Um, so I appreciate that. The other piece is that, you know, we've worked really hard using CARES dollar to allocate laptops for students who qualify for them. And we're um, almost done with that distribution. I think we have 300 more laptops to distribute. Um, and so our admissions, our enrollment management and Modifi's team is doing that. So again, it's really up to faculty to try to work with the students and I appreciate those efforts. Thanks Madhavi and Debbie. So now uh, another quick one for Debbie, since we're on the topic of activities of daily living, of teaching and learning. Uh, we have had an immense number of students asking for SU grading. And if we are going to transition to the policy we had last semester, will there be a decision or messaging to students announcing this policy will not be changed? Yep, thanks Jed. So as you might know, the student senate passed a resolution uh, requesting the same kind of modifications to the SU grading policy that we implemented last year. So we have an existing SU policy, but they want the same sort of flexibility that we provided last spring. That is up for discussion at University Senate this Thursday. And so we want that discussion to happen to see uh, what sort of questions and support we might get from Senate before any final decisions are made. Thanks, Debbie. A quick question for uh, Vice President Halgren. Uh, I haven't received any notifications from OSRR regarding positive students, although I know I have positive students because they have emailed me. Has the process changed or are students just not opting to have OSS OSRR email faculty anymore? So that's a great question. So I would have two responses to that. First, the process hasn't changed at all. And so again, uh, information is still coming up from OSRR. I think you may be right. We know that students are getting tested in other places, and so students may not be sharing that information with the university. If you hear from students that they are positive, I would encourage you to uh, remind them that OSRR would love to be able to support them while they are positive. And uh, the best way to do that is for them to uh, submit their information through the VOC form so that OSRR can be in contact with them. If you have specific questions about um, your particular class or classes, I would ask that you contact OSRR directly and Dr. Alex Pokernowski, just to make sure that um, you haven't, there hasn't been a, a gap somewhere and something hasn't been missed. Thanks, Kara, I really appreciate it. Um, this is a question for uh, probably, I'm thinking uh, Rosie, but others can chime in as well. Uh, the North Dakota Department of Health has suspended significantly de delayed any contact tracing for anybody showing up COVID positive, limiting, limiting parentheses, limiting the effectiveness of folks that are non-symptomatic but contagious, close parentheses. Students are being told to conduct and contact, uh, I think contact close contacts, not an exact science as creating quarantine efforts for close contacts that aren't really close contacts, is close contact tracing really occurring at this point? Uh, so I'm gonna turn this over to Rosie. Uh, and I, sure. to the preface, it's important to note, uh, the UND community is actually different from what's going on with the rest of the state. That's why we secured a contract with the State Department of Health to have our own contact tracer. So with that, Rosie, if you could kindly uh, provide some information on this. I would like to go back to stress that the North Dakota Health Department hasn't discontinued contact tracing. They still do inform every positive case of their positive status. And what they're doing is leading that positive case to go forward and identify their close contacts, providing them educational materials and assistance in identifying who would be a positive contacts and what to supply them for information. That all came about because of the huge number of positive cases that North Dakota has experienced. It basically is overloaded in a system that can reach out and identify, I shouldn't say identify, but uh, uh, individually contact each close contact. So if I'm a positive case, the state's going to call me and they're going to ask me about who I've been near, who I've 
uh, been with that meets the criteria of close contact, those persons are included in my case investigation, but they do not go out and call those people. I, it would be up to me to do that. Um, they still are identifying close contacts, but they're not the ones who are reaching out to them. When Jed mentioned that our university team is uh, maintaining its uh, past practice and uh, what the health, state health department was doing, we are continuing to do that practice. Our contact tracers, when we receive notification of a positive student, um, will reach out to the student for the case investigation. We also will uh, reach out to the close contacts to provide them information. They may not have a separate file in the state system as we, as we um, are used to in the past, but our response really has not changed. We are still reaching out to close contacts. Um, it really was a practice that was changed in response to the huge number of positives in our state. And unfortunately, contact tracing, we have widespread community spread now. Um, so contact tracing has become as, as valuable it is to us on our campus and our individual community. It has lost some of its effectiveness in the greater community because we are no longer able to necessarily go back and identify the source of the infection because it's so widespread. So we still need to, it's, it's still extremely valuable. I don't mean to sound like it isn't, but we have passed some of those stages of, of um, mitigation and now we're kind of in the mode of suppression. So some of our actions change for that. In addition to contact tracing, we, UND is in the process of assisting other campuses in North Dakota, their contact tracing as well. I might just add to the very nice explanation uh, by Rosie that, the, that in discussions with the Department of Health, this is not necessarily a permanent decision. As Rosie suggests, once we start getting on the other side of the curve and reduce the amount of community spread, then contact tracing will be much more effective and hopefully with the number of positives going down at some point in the future, those resources will then become reavailable to restart aggressive contact tracing. So it's not felt that this is an all or none or permanent decision. The Department of Health earnestly wants us to get into a position, us being North Dakota, to get into a position where they can be reinstituted at some point in the future. Thank you. Do that what was described to me was we want to make the most effective use of our resources. And right now that's what we have to do until we can get this under control. And then as Dr. Wynn stressed, resume the contact tracing to the higher degree that it was. Uh, now, uh, here's a bit of an interesting question. It's a definitely thematically different than what we've discussed before, but certainly timely. And it relates to the recent executive order that was issued by the Office of the President of the United States to uh, uh, change in some way the emphasis that's being placed on training uh, related to, uh, as it says in this question, race and sex stereotyping. Um, and uh, the question is about uh, essential academic freedom. What's the university's position on academic freedom as it relates to this executive order? And for this, I'm going to turn to both Andy and uh, Debbie Storrs. Thanks, Jen. I'll, I'll say a few words and then turn it over to the president. Uh, both the president and I are supporters of our academic freedom when it comes to diversity, inclusion, and all topics. And so we have a lot of speak to these issues and we're, it's essential that faculty have the support and the, um, the comfort in continuing to help educate our students on these really important issues. That remains uh, a real focus for us. And in our interpretation and understanding informed by Donna Smith, who's our EOC officer here at UND, we have every right to continue to provide that education to students. And so, um, Please know both, both the president and I are supportive of your efforts. Andy, do you wanna to speak to some of the other uh, pieces? That, you know, we continue to monitor what um, 
of this executive order is. And currently, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity, but the protection of academic freedom in the classroom seems to be one that it doesn't touch on in our understanding, and we want to protect that. Back Thank over to you, Andy. Yeah, Debbie, great, great comments. And um, we're monitoring, as Debbie said, uh, what our professional societies and professional organizations and our um, academic consultants are finding uh, and, and learning throughout uh, the evaluation of this new executive order. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll take all those inputs and, and make good decisions, but academic freedom is something essential to any university. And uh, as, as Provost Storr said, uh, we stand by those principles firmly. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, sort of a budgetary item here. Uh, we've gotten a question uh, that is, is UND considering a buyout program this year? Uh, BSIP as we call them. Uh, and if so, when will the information be announced? So as you probably know, uh, this has been something that we've been doing uh, annually almost, I would say certainly since the time that I've been here and I started in May of 2018, uh, whether or not there's a budgetary imperative to do it. Uh, and uh, so I think the answer is uh, that we're considering doing this. Probably we'll be talking about it at an upcoming executive council meeting and uh, whether whatever the outcome of that decision is, uh, we'll be going from there. Um, another question on uh, the Thanksgiving issue, uh, which is clearly in front of mind. Some students are not planning to return after Thanksgiving, forcing instructors to accommodate hybrid classes for those who would prefer in-class instruction. Many schools going to online only classes are impacting other schools instruction delivery. Will this continue to be a disparate? Will this continue to be a disparate? Okay, well, or will there be a standardized university policy? If yes, when will the decision be made? So Debbie, would you like to uh, address that and Andy also? Sure. Um if I understand the question, the decision has already been made that we're going to continue in our current process post Thanksgiving. So we're giving faculty the flexibility in how they're gonna deliver their courses. We're gonna to continue to offer them both online and hybrid. So um, I wasn't sure a piece of that question, it sounded like the students are requesting an accommodation and it's, um, yeah, Karen's nodding. That's what the question was. It's really a faculty decision on how they're gonna offer those courses. And um, hopefully you could accommodate a student, but really if the class is hybrid and it's scheduled to have rotating students in and out, students should, should plan on attending. Uh, Karen, do you have any other comments? Karen Plum, do you have any other things to add to that? Are you any of these requests on the part of students? I, I have heard um, from a lot of advisors that students are asking what their options are. And um, the feedback advisors have been giving is to talk to your instructors, talk to your faculty members about how class is going to be offered. Um, any accommodation that's made um, outside of an illness is up to the faculty member. Yeah, okay, great. Well, thank you. And I will say that um, I have heard from many, many students and from faculty that they are trying to be as flexible as possible. So again, you know, we want students to be as comfortable as possible and how they're getting the courses, but um, it is up to the faculty member. Dr. Uh, President Arakas, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Just one quick thing, and that is um, a lot of factors go into the determination of if we go all online. And we talked about some of the resource constraints and the trends with respect to infections, but um, our ability to deliver and our ability for individual faculty members to effectively deliver their classes is an important component of this. So if you could uh, provide more information up through your department chair to the Dean and up to Provost Stores about the specific um, instance here, uh, just so we can understand how broad uh, this impact is um, or if it's uh, relatively local. So um, that will help us um, uh, make good decisions as we uh, figure out how to navigate the rest of the semester. Thanks. So not surprisingly, Rosie's good explanation of uh, what's going on with contact tracing and mitigation versus suppression has generated lots of additional questions. So it's probably worth spending a minute or two on these. And I'm gonna ask this of both, uh, first of Dr. Wynn and then of Rosie Doe. Uh, the question is, can additional explanation be given for the difference 
between mitigation and suppression and what actions, processes may be different between the two and how does that impact UND decisions? Um, I can start with my not epidemiology education, but what I've been taught from epidemiology. And that is that basically when you have greater than 10% uh, community positivity rate and transmission, you move from what we call mitigation to suppression. So in my thinking, it's like we have set up all these practices to reduce the risk of spreading COVID, which is still important. But we have broken through a lot of those barriers. It, it is now all over the community. So now what can we do to minimize the effects of that widespread infection? So to me, it's like holding my finger in a dam and I'm trying to hold it back and much has leaked. And now what can we do to prevent it from getting even worse? What else can we do to protect the health and safety of our community? Dr. Wynn, do you have more to add to that? Uh, w w without getting, uh, without doing a public health epidemiology lecture, which I'm sure will put everyone to sleep. So I'm not going to focus on terms. I'm going to focus on two concepts. The concept that we used initially uh, was to uh, do widespread testing, contact identification, and then quarantining of contacts. That approach, uh, if you can do it in a widespread manner and aggressively, uh, we hope will prevent what we call community spread. And that approach, that's why we push so hard to have widespread testing, because widespread testing is the cornerstone of doing that. But even at present, with all of the testing we've done for the entire university system, since the start of the pandemic, we've only tested, only in quotes, roughly 40% of the student population. I may be off a little bit. Um, in, it would have been far better, had we been able to do it, to be able to test every student and do it repetitively. And then what happened when we got beyond that phase, when there is, as Rosie said, widespread community spread, what we need to do now is not simply to rely on widespread testing and contact tracing because that's not enough at this point to really bend the curve. That works early, but if unsuccessful as it's become, then the really the only tools that we have is to pro try to prevent the spread and that means four basic things that you've heard us say over and over and over again. But it's wash your hands, watch your distance, wear a mask, and limit the number of contacts you have with other people. Those are really the, the four key things we need to do now to get this back down to a level where then we can go back to effective identification of people, contact tracing, and so forth. That will help us when we get on the other side of this bulge, if you will. But since cases continue to go up, we need to do those four things as aggressively as we can because we cannot test our way out of this once we reach this phase. Then it's, it's the personal choices that we all make is going to be the only way we can start bringing the numbers down until we get more effective treatments and or a vaccine. And that's unlikely to be before next year. Thanks. So I think, uh, you know, just to echo this a little tiny bit, we're really in a place where our behavior, both individually and collectively, is going to drive the bus on bending the curve. And uh, I, if there's an important takeaway message from where we are right now, that's the takeaway message. Uh, so with that sort of, uh, you know, tough sounding uh, part, I think it's very important to turn our attention to hockey. And the next question is, uh, since the hockey team is going to be in the bubble in Omaha from Thanksgiving through finals, will faculty be required to accommodate them? So this actually is not a Bill Shaves question. I think this is more of a Debbie Storrs question. Is that right? 
I think it's, I'm happy to respond to part of it, but I would appreciate uh, Bill's comments as well in terms of how much time this will require of students um, playing hockey. So yes, faculty are asked to accommodate to students who are in sports activities. And so we would hope that you would accommodate this particular request. And in my understanding, and Bill, please correct me if I'm wrong, this is actually um, fewer days than on a typical semester pre-COVID that we would accommodate students who are off campus uh, to play hockey. Students who are in this um, on the team and playing will also have access to internet, so they should be able to access some of their schoolwork. And so maybe Bill, you could speak more specifically to how many days, for example, that faculty will have to accommodate. Yeah, thanks, uh, Provost Stores. I, I think, uh, and welcome uh, everybody. Uh, yeah, so we're really in real time right now. We don't even have the uh, schedule yet for the games at this point, but the one thing uh, that was crystal clear when the presidents uh, discussed this was that uh, all of the eight schools that are gonna go to Omaha were gonna be into the finals mode to some, uh, some degree. So for sure, um, our games are gonna be limited during that time frame, And so once we get the schedule, no different than any of our other student athletes, they will work with their professors and make sure that they know exactly what their schedule is at this point in time. So um, more to come, but Debbie is right. Uh, because we haven't played sports here this uh, semester, all of our uh, student athletes have been here in Grand Forks, right? And so at the end of the day, the uh, missed classes have been certainly at zero at this point in time. So uh, so knock on wood, we'll see if this uh, occurs or not, but certainly it's in play uh, for us to, to continue to discuss this, knowing where we are from a COVID standpoint. Okay, we've got about three minutes left of our hour. I have one 30 second question for Dr. Plum. And that is, when do we schedule a final during finals week for an asynchronous class? So I don't think asynchronous courses are part of the finals week schedule posted on the registrar's page. Um, so uh, those can be scheduled around students. We would ask that there's some flexibility, not choosing one day and one time because some students may have other courses that are not asynchronous that would conflict with that and that would cause a problem for them. Um, so recommending just if you give a little bit of flexibility in terms of when they can choose to take that final during finals week, um, that that typically works for an asynchronous course. Um, and if students do have a conflict, they are asked to talk to their instructor about that conflict and make a, an accommodation for that. Thanks, Karen. I actually understood that, which means you did a great job. So, so now let me turn this over to uh, President Armacost for a last few words as our hour closes. Great, thanks, Jed. And I appreciate all the great uh, comments and answers that uh, this, this great team has given to the, the viewers. Um, so faculty you raised a lot of great questions today in